Today the format is going to be um, kind of an overview of what each one of these individuals is working on at Story Studio. So we're going to start with Elena. She's going to give us kind of an overview of the history of immersive narrative and talk a little bit about her role as head of education there. Sure. Hi. So, um, so before I get into uh, deep into the VR space, I really like to talk about um, just the concept of virtual reality and the feeling of being transported somewhere else and this I whole idea of immersiveness. Um, and this is really what VR tries to bring you to, is blending, this, um, blending illusion and reality. Um, and this goes far back to, uh, this is the Sala della Prospettive, and this was in 1860. And this is in a completely you know, immersive environment that doesn't use any sort of technology. And I think we've all experienced walking into the beauty of a fully painted church and feeling lifted and feeling transported in some way. And at Story Studio, we like to take um, ideas from the past and from the larger perspective of how we can really feel transported to put it into the stories that we make. Um, so this also... and. You know, and I think just as a culture, people have been trying to get deeper into um, feeling part of something that they're not in at that moment, and even with photography. So this is the Victorian stereoscopic, um, simply taking a still image and making it more dimensional, and when that came out, that you know, wowed people. Uh, and then, of course, we're taken to the moving image, and at that point, uh, I think everyone talks about, when they talk about VR, the moment where the train was coming out of the theater and everyone ran. Um, so that even put us into a deeper state of immersion. And then taking uh, uh, inspiration from things all around us that have been creating story worlds for decades now, and a big uh, influence is theme parks. So Disneyland, when you go there, the whole world around you is an entire story world. We also like to talk a lot about immersive theater when we think about VR. Uh, it gives you that balance of giving you agency while also creating a story world. Uh, how many of you have gone to sleep no more? So that's referred to a lot. One of my favorites is Then She Fell and taking clues from uh, intimacy of a character and architecture of a space, um, not even really using technology and also sound and setting um, translates really well to VR. Another thing is projection mapping, and that's transforming the environment around you through projections to make the physical space completely change. Uh, and then this is actually a set setting from a game called The Vanishing of Ethan Carter. Uh, and looking at game makers, they've been creating story worlds for a long time now, and this is uh, the place of transition between storytellers and game makers. And uh, this, they used a lot of photogrammetry and really, really beautiful space. So um, now I'm going to take you a little bit into just VR and a very brief over overview. This is uh, Morton Halig. This is the Sensorama, uh, one of the first VR ideas. Basically, you stick your head in a box. Um, there's smell. There's wind. There's a vibrating chair. There's a video. And he was a cinematographer, and he actually created several videos for this. The challenge is that it's incredibly bulky. The technology wasn't there. I spoke to his wife recently, and it's in some storage. She's looking for a few hundred thousand dollars to get it back out if anyone, <laughs> if anyone is here is interested. But it shows the challenge of where VR was. You couldn't really do much with it because of its bulkiness and its expense. Um, and then this is Ivan Sutherland, which is the Sword of Damocles. Uh, and he said this great quote, which was, uh, this was a display connected to a digital computer gives us a chance to gain familiarity with concepts not realizable in the physical world. It is a looking glass into a mathematical wonderland. Um, and then the person who uh, has been credited with coining the term virtual reality, Jared Lanier from BPL Labs, actually started commercializing this. And instead of putting our head in a box, we now put the box in our head. Um, and this was in the 1980s. Uh, and this was the cave, which is an automatic virtual environment, which is a combination between VR and projection mapping that reacts to you. And then where are we now? So the VPL lab was in the 1980s, and now we're 
in 2016 already. And why, why are we at the space now where it's all converging and it's all coming together? Um, the technology is cheap enough, it's small enough, it's fast enough, um, not only to get into the hands of uh, consumers, but also to get into the hands of creators, because it really takes experimentation to understand how to push this medium forward. And a quick overview of um, the different types of VR. So this is, I think, what most people are familiar with right now. This is mobile VR-based work. Uh, you have cardboard, you have the Viewmaster. This is incredible because it's scalable. It democratizes VR. Um, the challenge with this type of VR is when you have it on your head and you move, you move the world with you. And that takes away a slight feeling of immersion. Um, and then you have the higher end mobile devices like the Samsung Gear VR. And now you have the Rift and it's coming out on March 28th, which is incredible. And you also have higher end headsets like the HTC Vive um, and the PlayStation VR. And the difference with this is that you see that sensor there. It senses you in the virtual space. So when you move, you actually move in that, in that physical space and you're able to start interacting with it. And what the key with VR is to really get a strong sense of presence and a deep immersion. Um, this is uh, well, the way to really do it. And in order to um, use the higher-end headsets, you need the higher-end computers. It's, uh, we're using game engines, and because everything is, so the difference between the cardboard and the mobile devices is that most of it is pre-rendered. It doesn't react to you in any way. Um, and with these uh, types of headsets that are more higher end, you need a much higher processing power um, because it reacts to you. You're living in that world with you. You're actually seeing a character and it can see you. And that requires these bigger computers. And soon enough, it's gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller and those different kinds of headsets are gonna start converging. And th the other exciting thing that's coming out and we're starting to experiment with storytelling is um, interactivity. Uh, and this is incredibly exciting. So this is where the convergence of gaming and storytelling is com coming from. And you can start um, being part of the world. Um, it includes a lot more challenges, but uh, <laughs> sorry, that's a different one. Um, but it, there's something very powerful about feeling part of that world with the touch controllers. And this is an example of social VR, which is also coming. So this is the toy box from Oculus, where you can have two people in one world together coming from different physical locations. So these people weren't in the same room. They're able to hand things to each other. There's also a section that they can play ping pong with each other in zero gravity. Um, and we're gonna start seeing more of this and start thinking about incorporating it into the story world as well. Um, and that's the brief overview. Thank you. Thanks, Elena. Um, so as Elena mentioned, um, the kind of immediate uh, future for Oculus is uh, the release of the CV1, their new headset, which is coming out on March 28th. And they just announced 30 uh, gaming titles that will be uh, a part of that launch. And you can also expect to see some work from Story Studio. Um, so now we're going to give a little bit of an overview about what those couple of experiences will be. And we're going to start with Sashka. Um, who was the director of Lost, which was the first experience that came out in January of 2015. And uh, it's an experience that transports you into a moonlit forest where you encounter a strange creature. So take it away, Sashka. Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanted to, Lost was our very, very first kind of narrative, or our very first stab at trying to do narrative in VR. Um, and as everyone probably we encountered a lot of problems because we all came from film, which is a very different medium. Um, some of the both came from games, which also help, but then in other aspects don't help because in games you play a character, you don't observe most of the time. Um, so I wanted to share with you kind of the, the basics of how we felt like it was best to begin a VR experience and kind of what we learned from ultimately failing in the beginning. And um, the thing with VR is that you get this incredible sense of being completely somewhere else, which is in and of itself very distracting if you are the storyteller and want to tell someone a story. 
Like if I plug you into an amazing new environment and also try to talk to you and tell your story, normally you just don't pay attention. And um, I think it was just a year or year and a half ago, people were wondering, like, oh, does presence actually break story? Can we not tell stories in VR? Um, and I think we can, but what happened basically is that when we first, when we had the first prototypes built of Lost, um, and we kind of had a small test audience of people who didn't know what it was or what's about to happen, um, we kind of gave them the headset, and they put it on, and I, you probably tried VR, so it's kind of weird in the beginning. You like put on this weird headset, and you stand in this room where there's other people, and it's, it's a bit disorienting and confusing anyhow. But then suddenly you see something, and what happens was people were just completely distracted by what was going on around them to follow any kind of narrative story thread. Um, they were so immersed, they felt so present that they were so distracted. And, um, and so we knew we had to do something because no one was listening to the story that we were telling them. Um, and what we did was, if you look at, to be honest, any kind of medium that tells a story, but if you look at, for example, cinema, um, the movie starts even before the movie. Because you go to the cinema, you choose to go to the cinema, you go into that big room, you find your seat, you settle down in your seat, and then the lights would dim, and old school wise, the curtains would open, now you have trailers that start before that. You would be confused nowadays if the movie would start without trailers, because you, the ritual is established. Um, and then normally movie starts with kind of the logo of the company and maybe the title sequence and there's a lot of things which kind of ease you into forgetting your surrounding and kind of focusing on, okay, now there's a movie and I'm not distracted by who sits next to me and eats popcorn. Um, so we were trying to figure out, okay, what is the equivalent in VR that we should do to get that sense of forget the world, follow what I'm telling you. And, um, the first part in that is what we call the in, which is basically just the very first thing that you see in VR. What is that? It's very important to think about someone puts on the headset, it's black, what do they see? And um, in, in the case of Lost, the funny thing was that was sometimes the very first thing people would ever see in VR because they had never seen VR a year ago. And um, in Lost, the very first thing that you see is um, it should come up there if the movies work. Um, is that, which is, starts as a tiny dot and then becomes Fee the Firefly. And um, the reason for Fee was that we wanted the very first thing you see in VR to be something tiny, something friendly, and something not overwhelming, but something singular that grabs your attention. And um, the other thing that Fee does is she flies to your left and she flies to your right, so people naturally start looking left and right so people who've never done VR suddenly realize, oh, I can turn my head around. So she's guiding you to do that. So once you kind of have something that raised your curiosity in a singular start of a story thread, that is when we start to fade up to the location that you're in, um, which is this beautiful forest at night. So we had this in moment, and then we bring you to the location. And that is, as I said earlier, normally where it gets really difficult because people just like, oh, forest, oh, there's a bush, oh, what is behind me, oh, what is there? And we realize we shouldn't fight that. It's stupid to fight that. So for us, the next thing after the end is just let go. As a storyteller, just let go of trying to force someone to listen to a story when they actually have tons of other stuff to do, which is explore their environment. Um, so that's what we did, like in Lost, basically the next 20 seconds, 30 seconds at least, is people can just look around. Like nothing will happen at all. And people can get used to their surrounding, can be like, oh, there's a tree, oh, there's a moon up there, oh, I can hear sounds. It's just kind of, we as storytellers let go and kind of give you as the audience the control to just settle in. Which, to be honest, the equivalent in a film of that would be a montage in the beginning. In a film, you would have a shot of a moon, you would have a shot of the forest, the moody camera move and things like this. But in VR, you as the audience, you create that yourself by looking around. Um, but then, I think it was 20, 30, 40 seconds, we actually kept it slightly flexible depending on the viewer. Um, that is when we start our story. And that's when the second kind of question and problem becomes, how do you get the audience's attention back? Because you purposefully lost it, but now you want it back. And um, 
what we did is we kind of, we, we jumped back to traditional movie tropes, which is we start with um, title credits. We're like, yeah, this is not a movie, but people know title credits, so let's just put title credits there, and people will intrinsically understand, oh, something is about to start. And we start music, so people are like, oh, something is going on. Something outside of my self-experiencing is happening, so maybe I should pay attention. But um, there's a moment when people still didn't pay attention, uh, where, the, where we added something more active, somewhere about there. And that always grabbed people's attention. Like Even if they still looked at the bush behind them, they were like, wait, what, what just flew by? Oh, there's a bird. Oh, it kind of it's even calling out to me. Something clearly is going on now. And it, it was about finding the right balance of not kind of shoving someone to listen, of kind of pulling someone along, hey, come on, listen, but kind of slowly calling out to them, being like, there's something going on. And it's, I think it's like 20, 30 seconds that we do that, just so that people can follow us at their own time. Um, and that's basically, does that slide work now? Um, oh, so ac actually we still had sometimes people that still didn't listen and watch. And the thing is the very first story thing that happens, because these are all triggers, these are all kind of small things of pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. But the next thing is the beginning of the actual story that happens in that forest. And that's kind of a strange thing that pops out of the bushes next to you. And um, we trigger that by a sound that you will hear is only from the right-hand side. And we wait with the first action until you look over there. So once you look to the right, that is when this thing pops up. But it won't pop up until you actually look there. And by that moment, we felt like testing it with people, that is really when we had people's attention. They had time to just explore, and then we got their attention back. So it's, in hindsight, and we still go through these things with any experience we do now, where it's like, what is the end? What is the very first thing you see? What kind of welcomes you, and what grabs your attention, but is a singular thing? And then, where is the moment where you just let go, where you let people settle in, explore their own kind of world. And then the third thing is how do we call them back to listen to the story? How do we not make them feel rushed or confused, but how do we slowly kind of guide them back to listen to the story we want to tell them? And it's, it's really kind of those things that, that, that helped us a lot to understand how the equivalent of going to a cinema is in VR, that you need to build it into the story, because normally where you put on your headset is not going to be in this nice theater environment. Um, that's going to be all for Lost. You can all watch it on the Rift when it comes out, because as Julia said, it will be available on the store. Um, and with that, I'm going to give it to, to Ramiro, who directed our second experience, Henry, which has a lot different challenges than we had in Lost. Mm -hmm. Do you want to move over? Yeah, let's, let's, let's go. Right. So thank you, Sashka. Um, so yeah, I'm Ramiro, I'm the director of Henry, that's our second uh, experience. It's coming out in a couple of weeks, super exciting. Um, so I'm going to play first a little trailer for Henry that we made. It's a separate experience that is actually out there on Oculus Share that you can download and watch it in VR. Uh, so you get a little bit more context because it's, it's still hard because you can't show VR, like, you know, we have been showing Henry like, like private, event, uh, private events, but we're talking about something that people haven't seen yet, so I need to give you guys a little bit more context. So this is what's out there. Uh, you can watch it in VR, and also it's on Vimeo and, and in general. Once upon a time, there was a little hedgehog named Henry. Henry wanted nothing more than to find a friend. But he loved to hug everyone he met. 
and because of his spikes, everyone would run away. Over and over and over again. It's lonely being a hedgehog. Until, on the day of his birthday, he made a wish that changed everything. So, what is Henry? Um, when when we started thinking about our second experience, uh, we realized that we hadn't, back then we hadn't seen anything based on, on like really emotion and, and connection with a character in VR. We're even asking ourselves, how would that feel? Like, would you really, because in the, it's, it's, just, it's different than a, than a movie, right? There's a separation in a movie where you watch, you're watching something on a screen. Here, you're sharing the physical space with the character. So that big question that seems so basic of, I, would I empathize with the character or not? It's something that we really hadn't seen. Um, so we set out to really make something where, what, that, was in, that was based on, on emotion and on, on, on connection and empathy with the character. Um, so we had this little idea of Henry, the hedgehog that loves to hug. And poor, poor little guy doesn't have any friend, obviously. Um, so uh, we started, as we all come from film, or pretty much all the creative director, direction comes from film, we started with the, the, the process that we know, which is, okay, let's make it like we will make a film. We started designing the character. You can see there some uh, concept design for uh, Henry, the house. We actually, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what changed during the process because we started like we would make a movie and then we realized that we needed to uh, adopt new techniques to work in VR. For instance, the house, we designed the house you see up there up, up right. And uh, when we actually built it in VR, we realized that this is much more, you have to think much more like architecture and not like a set for a, for where that you're gonna frame on a, on a, with a camera. You need to think more about the, the space and the depth of the space. We, you know, there's something really fun in VR that is that to really feel that sense that there's, there are things close to you and there, there are things farther away, like really use that depth. So we pushed, we really designed the house and really pushed that sense of, uh, of uh, uh, perspective and depth. So the house actually, actually has really different levels. It make it, it made, it made it really the, the space much more interesting and, and really give it, gave it a sense of that we were really using the space and not only creating for a screen. Um, we also, you know, thinking about the story, we actually did uh, traditional storyboards, which, you know, they worked in a sense. We, we, we planned them, you know, we, we started working on that. We, we, th we thought we had the story. But then, when we started actually working, putting this, the story in VR, it didn't work at all. We really, did, we, we really needed to change the story because things that, again, things that work on a screen, like the timing of, you know, it was very much more like comedic and action-based. You, you would see Henry like showing up in the house, running around the whole place, like setting up his little party. Uh, and it was great on a 2D screen. It was really, you know, cute, funny, charming, fast until like they would stop there and sit down and wait for their friends to, for their friends to come in and then we would cross this all, you know, like five hours later and no one showed up. They're all tools that work in, on film or on a, on a two screen and then we really tried to match that and timing wise it was horrible. Uh, you would see this little character running around you like crazy. They, there was no time for you to understand what was going on. Going back to what Sashka was saying, VR's new is overwhelming. You can't just put stuff around the people right away. You need time to let them feel the space, you know, get, get used to the space, get all the, the, the exploration out of, of, of their system so they can actually then enjoy a story. 
So we decided to change the beginning and make it much simpler, where just Henry will, will just come out of the kitchen and set the cake on the, on the table, very slow. Like, actually, if you see it as a truly movie, it feels slow. But in VR, you need that, because there's just much more information going on, and, and people just are going to, they are the camera, so they are going to find this, the interesting things, right? They, it's not that you have to serve them piece by piece what, what you want them to see. You have to let go, and they are, they are going to find what, what, they, what they find interesting. So storyboards, you know, the, you're going to hear me a lot say, we need to start working in VR. And this is one of those things that we're trying to do now, is instead of working on, on, a, on, a, on truly storyboards, see how we can quickly iterate on story, but directly uh, in VR, because it's something that we need to start doing. Same thing here, lighting, some lighting concepts. We did um, color keys by Goro Fujita, our art director. Uh, you know, trying to find that lighting mood the, in the house, the idea was to give a sense of warmth, something that feels comfortable so people can feel good about it. And I think we actually succeed on that. Like people really come out of experience saying, you know, because another thing we do is that they, we, I at least, I force people <laughs> to sit on the floor. Uh, so that really feels, when you're sitting on the floor, you show up in Henry's house, you're sitting on the floor at Henry's house too. Uh, and that makes you feel, first, it makes, it makes you feel like a kid, which I love because it's like you are really, it's like I'm going to tell you a little story as if you were a kid. Sit down on the floor, listen to the story. But also made people feel very grounded in the space. VR can be almost scary. You really, when you're standing and you look at something, you don't see your body, and that can be, it's like you are free to move, but at the same time you don't know if you can move. And sitting on the floor, we found that people were very, it made them feel uh, confident enough as to actually start exploring the space, crawling, and you know, looking around. Um, so making that space feel comfortable for them and warm enough to make them feel good about it was really important. Then part of the process, this is, we use Maya for animation. Uh, this is just a screenshot of how we worked all the character animation. Um, it's, this part of the process is quite similar as our, uh, traditional uh, animation, feature animation. Or, um, the difference is that on, in a movie you have shots, right? You, it, you have really short shots, like you know, two, seconds, two seconds, five seconds, depending. Here, is, Henry is essentially a, one, a single 10 minute shot where uh, when you need to organize the work, you need to like, you know, you have an animation team, you need to separate the work and let them do a little, little pieces uh, separately. And in this case, so we need to come up with a way of how could we separate that long 10 minute shot into pieces so people could work on, on separate moments and then stitch it all back together seamlessly. Very difficult, looking forward to uh, find new tools to do that still, you know, starting the process. We are, you know, early days, we are just trying to figure it out. But in general, it's, you know, it's a, it's a process that we know how to do, I think, animation-wise. And then we put it all together in the game engine. We use Unreal. This is a real-time engine. This, you know, comparing to Pixar, uh, in Pixar you have, you basically make a shot and then you throw it into a render farm and it takes 20 hours to compute and then you get a single image out of the, of the render engine. Here, this is real time. You can actually see the final image in, on the screen and work on it. You can see they're all like the, the lights from the lighting team to set uh, that they set in the, uh, inside the, the house. Uh, it's good and bad. It's great because you can see what you're doing. It's bad in the sense that we still need new tools again. Like, I think Unreal is awesome. It's amazing for what we do. Uh, and, and it's heading towards in, in the right direction, giving us more tools specific for VR. And here's the final frame. That's Henry sitting at the, at the, at the table with, with his little cake. So there's a little video here I want to show you. It's the, it's the moment when Henry actually shows up in the house. 
and there's something here that I want to talk about. You know, he comes out, there's no sound, by the way. He looks at you. And through the film, actually, he looks at you several times. You know, he's really happy, super excited about his birthday party. <laughs> so here, here Henry's looking at the camera, right? But in VR, he looks at you. He looks into your eyes. That's how it feels. And that's, that's a huge difference, actually. And we had this big discussion at the studio where we're asking ourselves, well, you know, the story is about a lonely hedgehog. He's alone on the, day of his, on, his, on the day of his birthday. But it feels like you are there with him. So we had that to choose between, should he actually acknowledge your presence in the space? But if he acknowledges your presence, that means that you are there. So that means he's not alone. So that means we need to change the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> or he doesn't look at you at all. And you know, he's like, OK, he's alone. I'm just here like a witness or like a ghost. Um, which would have been valid, but we were, you know, let's, and, and this is actually one of the things that I'm almost like the proudest, is that we actually went and tried something different, is that let's try what, what would happen if he actually acknowledges your presence, but it's still, you're still part of the audience. You are not there for him. Like he sees you, it's almost like breaking that fourth wall. Um, and it actually worked. That's, that's what fascinates me is that uh, we were like, and we're still actually at the studio discussing that it, does, it works, it doesn't work. But what I found is that in general, when I show it to people from the industry, you know, we, when we see something with him, we tend to deconstruct everything. And they are like, oh, why? You know, why does Henry look at me if I'm not there? I don't understand, you know? But then when, she, when I show it to, regular audience, they actually love it. They don't even think about why that, this, that logical disconnection between I'm here, but I'm not here. They just understand that Henry is looking at them, acknowledging the presence, but you are not part of, of that world. And they love it because they, it's, I think it comes from film also, kind of like that, those moments where the actors look into the camera. So they, there's a language there that, that, that is familiar. But they love those moments because they are really, really powerful when he actually looks into your eyes. And I, we actually, like actually Sashka found those moments where it's not random, it's not any time. It's actually Henry shares the moments where he's feeling something, where he's happy here, he's excited, he looks at you kind of like, hey, this is cool, right? Then he gets sad because he realizes there's no one. He actually kind of like, you know, all those moments of emotion, he's sharing them with you. It's extremely, it's, it's, it's extremely powerful and it's, I, to me, the conclusion of that experiment is that logically, it wouldn't have worked. But this is, this is a new medium, and we need to try. The only way we can really advance it is let's try and let's show it around. Let's see how people react to these things. It's less of a logical conclusion. It's more of a, well, let's try it. Let's, let's go ahead, try it, show it to audience, and learn from it. I think that's how we are going to keep advancing the medium. So I have a slide here where a few differences between traditional cinema and, and immersive cinema. In traditional film, you have linear timing, right? It's a sequence of events that go from beginning to end. In VR, timing depends on the audience. We can time the experience depending, we can make it interactive. Depending on where you look at it, it can last, you know, eight minutes, it can last 15 minutes. In movies, you have edits and cuts. Um, in VR, we are not doing cut points. In a movie, you have a lock perspective. You, the director sets the camera, right, for the audience. You, it's locked and you only see what you have to see. In VR, the audience can look anywhere. It's up to you to either let them experiment and, and, and really explore or actually try to lead their eye into the story. In traditional animation, we have hours to render a single frame. In VR, we have 11 milliseconds to render a single frame. It's a huge, huge task, and, and we are, uh, you know, with time, it's going to get better. Uh, but still, lots of resources to try to make Henry as cute as possible, but also fast enough that he can actually play in a, in a computer, in a regular computer. 
In film, we have storyboards that typically transition very well to the screen, up to the point where when you make a movie, you have storyboards, and you pretty much swap those for the final shot, and it works very similar. In VR, what might work in boards might not work in a virtual space. We need, we need to get to tools where we, we can actually work in VR and see what we're doing in VR. <coughs> and uh, in movies, you work with software that is designed for film. And here, we're working with software that is designed for games. And little by little, it's, it's, it's gearing towards you know, adapting those those uh, techniques from film and make it make make this software more capable of or easy, give us easier tools to work with so we can uh, dedicate more time to explore and experiment and less to actually fight the tool or, or try to, to you know try to find ways to work around uh, things that tools are not still there right so well, with that I'm gonna hand it back to Sashka he's gonna talk about our next uh, project we're working on right now at the studio. Sashka? Yeah, I'm going to try. It, this is just a glimpse of the project we're working on right now. I think we have like five minutes of slides left, and then we'll do Q&A. Actually, maybe we ask you questions. We'll see. I'm wondering what format might be the most interesting. Um, but yeah, so a glimpse of the future. Um, so this is the Angelica, um, our next project. And um, it's kind of a bit unlike anything we've done before. And, um, and that is mostly based on that the visuals will be entirely created through something we call illustrative VR. And um, so let me explain what I mean by that. Um, we knew kind of from the beginning on that we wanted to create a VR piece that feels like an illustration, but that you're inside of it, that you can walk around in it. And um, so we brought into the project, we started collaborating with an illustrator, Wesley Allsbrook. And um, initially, when we started to work on the project, she worked in the traditional way. She kind of on a Cintiq or kind of on paper, she drew what the images should look like. We scanned them in, and then you kind of give them depth, and you space them around in the three-dimensional space. and um, but there was something strange to those things um, that they never, it felt like flat drawings put onto geometry or flat drawings put onto surfaces. It didn't, it felt like it was this old medium trying to put into the new medium. And um, it was especially one of our coders, and I think, to be honest, in VR, that mix of art-oriented people and code tech-oriented people, that is where it lives. If you only have art, it won't work. If you only have tech, it won't work. It's truly that the marriage of the two. Um, and one of our coders, who is an incredible artist as well, Inigo, um, he was annoyed in us trying to use old tools to create for a new medium. And so he created a tool um, that we're calling Quill now. And um, that basically is a tool for Wesley to draw inside of VR versus drawing on a flat page. And um, should be a video. And what you see is Wesley is holding the Oculus Touch controllers in her hand. Um, and so when she moves her hand, she's creating lines in the virtual space. And she colors in in the virtual space, and she colors in the space around her, and she details everything in in the space around her. And the interesting thing for us as well was that this tool was born out of not the idea of creating a tool, but out of the idea of we want to achieve something visually. We want to visually, we have a goal. And then we found we don't have the tool to create this. So the way Quill is evolving right now internally is that Wesley is the single customer. Wesley is like, oh, I want a line to be more like this, because that is how, I, as an artist, I used to work or I want to first work in shades of gray and then color in those shades of gray because I first think about light and shadow and then I think about color. Um, and it's, it's really that collaboration of art driving technology. Or to be honest, in this case, first VR is a technology rising up and that inspiring 
artistic expression, and then that artistic desire to express something, again, driving a technology innovation. Um, and that's, that's kind of the, the, the core of the Angelica, is to find something like this, to push ourselves to let's create virtually um, in VR and, what, and put an artist in there to create directly inside of it. I want to close kind of with, with a few words about where we're at, and I think there's a lot of talk always about that, but um, that we're in the early days and we're kind of in the pioneers like it was with film, but what's important for us and, and what, what we're trying to do, and I think what the whole community right now is trying to do, which puts us in a diff very different place than film was in the beginning, is that we have conferences, we have the internet, we have a way of sharing everything that we have. Um, that's a photo of the, um, of the Millier Brothers workshop at the time. And of course, barely anyone was able to visit it. But now we can go out, we can come to places like this through our university efforts or on our blogs. We kind of share all the stuff that we do. And everyone else out there shares all the stuff that they do. So we can all learn so much faster from the things we do and from things other people learn. And um, because it's not, if it would be just us doing stuff, it would take forever to really get to a point where a narrative VR experience feels like something unique. Right now, we're still at the stages where they're closely reminiscent of film and other things, but we're slowly getting to them feeling so unique that when we showed early tests of the Angelica to people, they were like, I couldn't explain what it is in, to someone who hasn't seen it. The same way as you can't explain VR to someone who hasn't seen it. And, um, and that is not just us exploring that. Like that's, there's a lot of amazing people out there who do explore that medium, who experiment in that medium. So before we open it to questions, we wanted to share a small film that celebrates some of those amazing artists that work out there as well, from whom we learn daily, and hopefully they learn from us. And the nice thing is it's actually all a really, really tight family community. So as soon as you start in that world, you kind of get to know each other and you share all the knowledge. So before we jump to questions, I think this panel is called Story Studio University. <laughs> so as head of education, Elena, do you want to tell us just a little bit about that program? Yeah, so um, Oculus Story Studio University is really 50% of the Story Studio mission. Um, we have a small team of people from Pixar, from DreamWorks, from the gaming world, understanding, taking the first steps of this challenging thing of creating interactive, live rendered stories in virtual reality. But we know that if we just continue being a small team doing it, we're not gonna push forward at all. So we started an initiative to try to inspire a whole new generation of creators to push forward, to make experiments. Film only became what it is because people figured out that a cut worked or a close up worked and we want whole new level of creators to take that into VR. So we're sharing all of the information that we know. Um, we're hoping to create communities who do that. We're working with universities um, and creating different strategies. So we're really there for the community. Questions? Do we have time for questions? Two minutes. Two minutes. All right. <laughs> Two minutes. Go. Um, I guess right here in the third row. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you're Sound, sound is amazing and tricky. Um, we kind of, I mean, to be honest, the, the, the hardest challenge is kind of a bit of a software challenge is that initially in film, you just have the editing software. And it's such a, by now, editing software, it's such a simple, pure, one person, really fast iteration loop step. You can throw sound design to stuff, you can just like, rough things in and um, and that's really tricky in VR because you use game software that is much more flexible. Um, the final polishing touch is actually fine like we did on Henry we did the final mix of it at Skywalker Ranch and all that stuff and then we put it back into the game engine. Once you know what the whole thing is the polish part of it was fine but the earlier stages we work a lot with um, sound designers who come from games because they understand that flexible process of not having a timeline. Um, because basically in game software, it doesn't have a timeline, but it has events that are triggered at certain moments. 
So the sound designers attach their singular sounds to those events, and those events can stay time flexible when they happen. Um, but getting more sound designers from film in is a challenge to, it's a software challenge basically, because it's used a very set, different set of software tools that people use. It also, we did, we took a pass at the Skywalker sound for Henry, and the approach was also, you know, those guys work in film. Um, and uh, we took a pass, as in like, we made a recording of the whole thing, and then they added sound to it, but then, because it runs on a game engine, uh, the game engine is what is actually playing the sound. And depending on where you're at in the space, right, like the closer you are to, to, to something, it's gonna sound louder, and if you go farther away, it sounds, it, it, you know, it sounds, uh, uh, it, you can hear it that well, and that basically screws up all the sound mixing that they did, because they did all that sound mixing for film on a screen for that, but then if you try to kind of like put all those sound sources in your space, it doesn't sound the same at all. So in the end, you end up using that as a reference of the, like the film um, look you want to achieve in sound, um, but then you need to replicate that in a game engine. Now you're going to lose some things and you're going to gain others, um, but it's a, it, in the end it's a reference and you have, to, you have to think more about that space and what's the cinematic feeling that you want to you want to achieve. There's one more on the mic here. Go ahead. Um, I was just, I saw Henry at Sundance and I absolutely loved it. The one part that really didn't work though was the eye contact, just mm -hmm. because I just didn't understand who I was. Now, mm -hmm. granted, I've probably seen more VR films than many people in this room. Are you starting to see people that have seen more VR films start to build this own grammar in their own mind? Because the first thing I said was, she's looking at me, who am I? And then I just filled in the gap and I said, oh, I must be like a stuffed animal or something that I can't see. <laughs> um, so I don't know, what was your experience with people that had just walked into VR for the first time seeing it and then versus people that have already seen enough where they're sort of like mm -hmm. used to situations where they're in a presence? Mm -hmm. I mean, in my opinion, it's so early that we don't know yet what is this who you are, what, how does it work, am I doing it right? Um, my opinion is that in the, like once we develop the language and people get used to, to VR, uh, there's, there's not gonna be that question anymore. And it's gonna, you know, some experiences are gonna be just uh, first person experiences where obviously you're part of the world. Some others are gonna be like Henry, which is kind of like the middle ground. Some others are like completely passive. They don't look at you. And it's going to be understandable, and it's going to be part of that, that language. But I think, the, I think part of the confusion is, is the whole thing of the like, novelty of the, of the whole thing. But we're going to get there, and I think it's going to... We need flexibility, basically, to tell many different kinds of stories. And I think you need to be able to count with, with all those options, instead of saying, no, it has to be first person, or it has to be completely passive, and they, they don't even look at you. Um, I mean, as I said, I, I found a lot of people who didn't really w even worry about that. They just loved the idea, the, the, the feeling of, of having that contact. Let's see how it evolves. It's, you know, in the end, it's all about that. I don't know if you, Sashka. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it, it began, to be honest with, we had a version where it doesn't look at you mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. And um, when you watched it, there was a strange sense that you were there. I mean, you knew you were there. You, like, it's hard to convince your brain you're not there. And it felt weird that he doesn't react to you. It felt like you're in this space. This character goes through all that stuff. And there was a strange artificialness about you being there without somehow being incorporated. Um, and it felt like this way, it was less downsides. It felt right because, I mean, in hindsight for us, it was in a movie, there is the fourth wall because as soon as an actor looks at the camera, you're aware, oh, there's a camera, oh, there's a screen, oh, I'm sitting in the audience. But in VR, you have no, there is no fourth wall because you are there. So it's weird to artificially erect a fourth wall. Um, and that's how it felt like, it was like there was a wall between me and the experience. But I do agree that it's, we're just not used to it. Like in theater, I might be used to the actor sometimes looking at me, but generally in the mediums we know that doesn't happen. So we come from a preconception of 
am I, am I something, am I not something, why does he look at me, like all these things I think come from because it's so new and we kind of, we need to try things out and the audience needs to grow with us. Some people haven't seen anything, some people have seen tons of stuff, so it's a, it's a mutual growth of kind of getting used to things and I think it's actually more interesting to do things that confuse people than to preemptively not try those things. Yeah. Yeah, that's the whole thing about we need to try and do it and see how it feels. It's really, we can't be the ones who are saying, no, this doesn't work, because in the end, we, we don't know what's going to work in the end. So it, it's a matter of, of trying to make stuff, trying to just do it and, and put it out there and, and see how people really adopt it. Yeah. I'm curious, how many of you guys are creating VR? Wow. Oh, cool. Oh. Um, well, you should come talk to the panelists. Uh, after we're done, which I think is now. Um, so thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your South Vibe. Thank you. Thank you guys.